everyone. My name is Domi Raymond, Dominique Raymond. I'm a strategy director with Lumina Foundation, and we're delighted that you are able to join us today for what we see as the movement moving forward as we work on convenings virtually. Um, Lumina Foundation is a, an independent foundation uh, based in Indianapolis. We do national funding and thought leadership work uh, that really supports uh, higher learning for all beyond high school. And our focus is really focused on an equity agenda as we do this work. As we do the work, we look and we make certain that any of the policies that we support encourage and it uplift individuals so that they're learning, particularly if they're people of color, African-American, Latino, as well as Native Americans. We we, monitor, we encourage that we do this work through our thought leadership capacity, through our portfolios of work, through our grant making, as well as we ensure that the work and that we move forward with the work um, through our goal. We have a goal of 25% of Americans will have a degree or credential of value by the year of 2025. Without question, this work is critically important. We know it. Um, but what we found is, is that we all know we are in the midst of a, an upheaval in this country across the world um, that's died, tied to the global pandemic, that's tied here to the U.S. Um, to racial reckoning. And what we do know is that learning beyond high school can help solve many of these solutions. We also know that at Lumino, we had a what I feel was a really and still feel is a terrific convenings capacity. We used to bring people together in person, but obviously the pandemic has drastically changed that. Um, so what we've been able to do, and it's a term people use a lot, we found a silver lining in this idea of having a virtual convening where we can bring people together to move from a spark to a shift or shift to a spark <laughs> the other way around. Um, where we can really galvanize action with really thoughtful conversations, not only with some of our key partners, but with new partners and emerging partners. So we said to ourselves, what organization can help uplift our thinking in the midst of this upheaval that can also talk about race, learning, and culture um, in the context of how we think about it at Lumina? And immediately came to mind, with the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, let me give a shout out to Ashley Bennett uh, with the Smithsonian Institution, who reached out to us actually pre-COVID and saw the connecting points between Lumina, our work, and the work that the Smithsonian does. So what I'd like to do uh, just as housekeeping um, to get us started, what I'll do is, is just talk about the agenda. Again, we're thinking about spark to a shift. Um, and. We're going to start off with Eduardo Diaz. He's the executive director of the Smithsonian Center, and he'll have conversations with different one of us from Lumina, my colleague Amber Garrison Duncan, um, who leads a lot of our systems of work around how do we change the whole system of learning um, in higher ed uh, or post secondary ed learning. Paola Santana. Uh, Paola actually is part of our state policy team. States are a unit of analysis for us at Lumina. And so Paola's work, just as with Amber's, is critical and essential. And also Jasmine Hayward. Jasmine is part of our team, uh, originally part of our strategic impact team, knows about the data, the metrics and the like, but also is really um, internal at Lumina uh, around quality work that we're doing, as well as work that we'll be doing with faculty. Uh, but in addition to that, um, really comes with deep knowledge and research based on um, the diverse populations within the Latino community. Uh, so a couple of housekeeping matters before we get started. <laughs> we do want this conversation to continue on our socials. Uh, so we do have, um, uh, you'll see these slides that will include how you can tweet about us. We, you can tweet um, shift shift, no, spark a shift. I don't know why I keep getting that backwards, but spark a shift. Um, and our Twitter, Twitter handle at Lumina is at Lumina found. Um, we also want to encourage you to visit our website after this is over. We'll be posting all of this terrific material um, on our website. I want to talk a little bit about our website, A Stronger Nation. 
again, data is important to us. And so we want to also encourage you to go to our Stronger Nation website. We have this remarkable and wonderful uh, data tool that you can use to help identify post-secondary entertainment and drill down into the work. So you can easily just uh, reach that with a stronger nation. Um, and with that, I think I've taken care of all the housekeeping matters. We want you to chat. We want you to chat often as you want. And as, you're, as we're talking, go ahead and put those questions in the chat box for us. Uh, and again, even if you want to continue conversations with us afterwards, go ahead and identify that in the chat and we're happy to reach out to you. We're also going to ask you if you wouldn't mind just putting your sharing with us your name and your organization as you put it in the chat. And then that way, and also identify who you want the question to go to after you've heard from all of my colleagues and I. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. I would love to introduce everyone to Eduardo Diaz. I swear, I've only known Eduardo for two weeks, but I feel like I've known you a lifetime, Eduardo. You're amazing in the work that you're doing at the Smithsonian Latino Center. Shame on me, I will say this. I always thought of the Smithsonian as this place of enrichment and fulfillment for me personally, having lived in DC for years and knowing that the Smithsonian's all over the place. And I will admit, yes, I do look at the Panda Cam. I still look at it. <laughs> uh, but you really elevated the conversation for all of us. And we wanted to say we're thankful and grateful for that. That, as you said to us, Smithsonian is not .org, it is .edu for a reason, that you are a learning institution. So we would love to hear from you about the Smithsonian, um, as well as the Smithsonian Latino Center. Thanks, Eduardo. Hey, no, thank you very much, Domi. I really appreciate um, the invitation to participate in this, in this webinar. Um, I don't know, the Smithsonian is big. The Smithsonian is the probably the largest history, arts and culture and scientific institution in the world, certainly in this country. And the job that we have at the uh, Smithsonian Latino Center is to represent the contributions at the, um, if, well, if you think of the Smithsonian as the nation's museum, for example, our role at the Latino Center is to ensure that we understand the Latino communities uh, role in building, literally building this country and shaping its national culture. So presence, ensuring Latino presence at, at the nation's museum, at the Smithsonian, is critically uh, important, not only at the museums, but at their archives and the libraries and the research centers and so forth. And so that's really what our job is. And someone asked me what my job is, and essentially it is to help transform the Smithsonian into a Latino serving institution. And we do that in a number of ways in terms of supporting research, exhibitions, collections, public and educational programs, internships, and I know we're gonna talk about that more in depth uh, later on in the program. But we also have quite a bit of online resources as well, and we're gonna talk about that as well, the Learning Lab in particular. Our museums and archives are also available online, and so there's a lot to be said for uh, accessing the resources uh, in that way as well. We're also on Google Arts and Culture, so we're looking for a variety of platforms where Smithsonian resources are available uh, to folks. So it's um, it's an incredible task. Uh, you know, the Latino community is around 18% of the population now and, and growing and very diverse uh, culturally, ethnically, racially, geographically, geodemographically in all ways. I know that you're into statistics and metrics and so it's important to pay attention to, to all of that. We are in the process of developing a Latino gallery at the National Museum of American History, the Molina Family Latino Gallery. And that is consuming quite a bit of uh, my time and as well as this, our small staff. Uh, we're very excited because it will be the first time in the history of the Smithsonian where the Latino community has a, a physical space on the mall. So that in a nutshell is what we're up to uh, in terms of Latinidad, if you will, at the Smithsonian. Wonderful. Um, just really just delighted to hear that. And, um, you know, Eduardo, you touched a little bit on uh, what we will be talking about as well is post-secondary entertainment is, uh, as you know, is really luminous sweep spot along with our equity imperative and believing and knowing that equity is at the center of all of the work that we do. So I wanted to bring in my colleague, Amber Garrison Duncan, to talk a lot about really just the work that Lumina is doing around pathways, um, how they affect or really enhance and promote Latino students, what it is that we need to do, and just what's 
right at the right time at the right place. And we can then talk about a connecting point between Smithsonian and, and Lumina. Amber, Amber, take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Domi, and um, good afternoon or good morning, depending on which coast you're on. Um, it is such a privilege to be with you today, um, especially as our country is addressing two public health crises, COVID-19, which is new. Um, however, systemic racism has been around for ages, and uh, we know that the impact of these two things together is having a disproportionately um, impacting Black, Latino, and Indigenous peoples. Um, and is looking at the attainment rate of uh, Hispanics or Latinos ages 25 to 34 um, who have attained an associate's degree or higher, meaning um, a bachelor's degree or on beyond. And so we wanna hone in on this number as something that's really important in framing up um, the rest of our conversation here, because as Domi mentioned, Lumina is committed to creating a system that delivers fair results. And when you look at that percentage rate and you compare that to um, the attainment rate for white people in this country, there is a huge gap that exists. And so um, what Lumina is committed to is an equity first approach, meaning our work is, is focused on eliminating those gaps. We are prioritizing our work around um, Black, Latino, and Indigenous peoples, and that we really see um, the ability of our system to deliver those fair results by uh, working through a broad range of credentials. Um, what we have in this country um, is a very diverse um, credentialing system, and we know that there's many paths to prosperity, and we wanna make sure that people have access to the right pathway at the right time um, to gain the right credential they need to unlock their economic mobility. And so again, we elevate the range of high quality credentials that can create that opportunity for people. And that definitely includes bachelor's degrees and associate's degrees, but we also know credentials like certificates, apprenticeships, and industry certifications um, are also provide real opportunity. And while we're doing that elevation, we also challenge system leaders to monitor these systems and ensure that populations of people are not being tracked only into certain programs and professions because of their race or gender. And I wanna highlight that because that is a historical um, problem that we've had in this country and how racism has shown up in our system of credentialing and limits opportunity for people. Again, that's just one example of how we take an equity first approach to all of our work and we seek partners um, and support organizations and institutions that are explicitly focused on Latino, indigenous, and black learners. If you go in and visit, um, you know, I wanna go back to why these gaps exist. Um, and again, that the, uh, between those attainment rates. And I wanna be very clear that these gaps are the result, again, of a system with a history of educational segregation and discrimination, that Latino students and their families know the importance of education and have been fighting for access even setting the stage in this country through Mendez versus Westminster for the Supreme Court ruling that ultimately struck down separate but equal education. And the good news is that today more Latinos are enrolling in post-secondary learning opportunities than ever before. They're pursuing higher education despite the systemic racism and, and succeeding. But we know in order to meet the needs of a rapidly growing Latino population, we need more of these quality pathways and we need more institutions to implement student success strategies that support the educational, the financial, and the holistic needs of Latino students. There is a lot of progress underway to redesign these systems and again, remove roadblocks that um, stand in the way so that Latinos can be successful. Institutions of higher learning are opening up opportunities that recognize and utilize the cultural assets of Latino students, including the work that Eduardo mentioned and highlighted that can help lead to a credential in a new way. Later, we will also hear from Gabriela Padilla, who is a shining example of what is possible when our colleges and universities implement programs and services that meet the needs of Latino students. We know many of you on with us today are doing this work. We hope to be able to ele elevate and amplify your work. And if you're new to this conversation, we hope you will make at least one commitment today for Latino students and be able to join us in this work by again, supporting the educational, the financial and the holistic needs of Latino students. Back to you, Domi. Bra Bravo, Amber Garrison Duncan. Oh, 
yes, he's right. Okay. <laughs> um, and really, Amber just amplified really just the entire vision, really, I think, at Lumina. Um, I will say this. I've been doing policy work for decades. And Lumina is this place. Um, we have wonderful, strong leadership with Jamie Marisotis, our executive team, and the like. And everything that Amber has just laid out, is it's a one-voice thing at Lumina. It's not Amber saying it or us. It is really Lumina. And um, you'll find that we do have partners across the country um, that we know. And so that's why we think this emerging conversation with the Smithsonian um, really feels great to us and, and lockstep to us around how we can connect with others around this important critical work um, to improve Latino success. I wanna bring in my colleague, um, Paula Santana. And Paola um, is part of our state policy team. And as we said, it, we do believe um, that states for us are the unit of analysis. Lumina has really had states at the forefront of how do we create um, really big, broad systemic changes um, across the country as they as it elevates student success as a measure as a measure of elevating student success. And the way we do that at Lumina is really through partnerships, what Amber talked on a little bit. Um, and so what we want to do here is we want to talk with Paola a little bit. Maybe we engage with Eduardo some, and then we're going to then um, roll and Eduardo can tell us a little bit about um, the program that uh, Gabriella is a part of, uh, and then we'll proceed from there. So let's start with you, Paola. If you could share with us um, some of the work that Lumina is doing or really the state partners are doing, um, that would be terrific. Thank you so much, Domi, for inviting me to participate in this conversation with such an important institution um, here in our country. I know that I've had so many amazing experiences at the Smithsonian Museums over the years, so I was super impressed to learn about some of the work that Eduardo and his team are doing uh, for today's Latino students, uh, and we'll be hearing about that work a little bit later. Um, but I... As I was reflecting on this, I thought that their work is really timely, um, as Domi and Amber have both referenced. Our Stronger Nation data tells us that educational attainment remains really unequal across our country. Uh, while Latinos have made small but steady gains in post-secondary access and attainment nationally, those gains are really not enough to close the gaps that we see when we compare it to other groups. And we actually see those gaps growing in some states, which is, which is concerning. Uh, through the state policy work at Lumina Foundation, we work with state leaders and with policymakers to explore policy solutions that can help raise post-secondary attainment and address the inequitable outcomes that we see throughout the country. Uh, and I will say that our state partners realize that these inequitable outcomes really limit the economic opportunities that their Latino residents have and that they realize that those attainment gaps really have to be eradicated in order for us to reach our shared goals of racial justice and equity. And so I'm gonna highlight a couple of examples of what our state partners are doing in response to these challenges and really try not to get too technical here, but I definitely wanna highlight some of their good work. Um, I think first, due to the growing calls for racial justice across the country, there's really a growing recognition and acknowledgement among our state partners that many of our systems in this country, including higher education, are rooted in racism and exclusion, and that to make them work for today's students who are much more diverse than in the past, those systems really have to be examined and redesigned um, when we see outcomes that are inequitable. So earlier today, Lumina Foundation announced um, that Massachusetts is receiving a talent innovation and equity grant. Uh, they'll be joining a cohort of five states which have pledged to reduce attainment gaps for students of color by 5%. So their Department of Higher Education is going to be working on a policy audit that will examine all of the state level policies for disparate outcomes. And they're gonna be working to retool all of those policies to better serve their students, including the growing number of Latinos uh, that are enrolled across the Commonwealth's institutions. So we think that this is a really promising approach uh, that can help uh, result in some systemic changes to improve outcomes for those Latino learners and for other marginalized uh, groups. Uh, 
Um, other partners are really recognizing that funding can serve as the lever for change. And so some states are examining how their funding formulas can better support completion for Latinos and other historically unrepresented students. So some of our state partners are including weights or premiums that allocate additional dollars to those institutions in their states that are really being successful at serving and graduating these students, including um, our Latino students. Um, so we definitely believe in that approach that states should be putting their dollars towards their highest priorities and closing those racial equity gaps that we see is definitely um, at the top of that list. Um, the last example that I want to highlight um, it has to do with ca uh, campus climate and culture. And in my opinion, uh, you know, the culture on a campus, the climate the, on a campus around race can really make or break uh, Latino students' post-secondary experiences. So we have some partners that are really uh, examining how they can improve that racial climate at their institutions to ensure that all of our students are feeling included and that they have an opportunity to succeed. So that includes our partners in Colorado, which have published a toolkit for faculty on inclusive teaching and learning. And our partners in Kentucky who are taking a similar approach um, by actually creating a cultural competency certification for students and staff and for faculty to make sure that the campus climate is really welcoming, that it's inclusive, and that it's enabling the success of all students, including our Latino learners. So these are just a couple of examples that I wanted to share about what some of our state uh, partners, those state leaders and policymakers are doing to improve policy and practice so that our systems better serve our Latino students. Um, and at Lumina, we know that these state leaders can really play a role in elevating and scaling practices that contribute to student success. So you'll be hearing about the Smithsonian's efforts in that space uh, now, when I turn it over to Domi, thank you very much. Domi, back um, to you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Paula. I mean, totally spot on. Listen, I'm such a I'm such a policy nerd. I'm like, yes, 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 yes. You know, <laughs> everything you said is spot on, and I think the way you delivered it. I hope as we are sharing this with audiences, both um, new to us and those that are friends. Um, that they understood everything that you're saying, that, that states actually can provide great resources for us and that we are, we're not the only ones doing great state policy work. Um, we have philanthropies, we certainly have the states themselves without question, uh, leadership, governors and the like. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, I wanna, before I take it to, uh, to Eduardo um, to talk about what they're doing with their museum studies program, I, I, I just wanna bring back those numbers again. So Amber mentioned earlier, the 27% of Hispanics ages 25 to 34 in the country are getting associates um, and uh, degrees and, and, and or higher is the percentage and how we certainly have a lot of work to do. Just wanna plug again, a stronger nation. It's an interactive website. You can. You can tunnel down to the county level um, using our Stronger Nation data tool. And let that be a case for action for you as an individual, or are you a nonprofit, or are you a state? Use that as an opportunity to galvanize the work. The other part is, is that um, we really do have a focus on working adults as well. Um, you heard Amber talk a bit about, it is a bachelor's degree without question. We have associate's degrees. There are a lot of short-term credentials, um, both certificates, which are offered at higher ed institutions and certifications, which are offered uh, by employers usually. So all of that counts in the learning. And it's critically important that you remember that, um, if you remember anything that we're sharing <laughs> with you. Um, the other part of this is, um, so we you saw a graphic of the 6.2 million uh, degrees by 2030. We think that there are some organizations that are terrific resources. There's Unidos US, and all of this will be on our website. Um, Unidos US recently just did a study, um, a qualitative study of just um, learning information about Latino students who are the majority of which are first generation learners. Um, and the 6.2 million by degrees by 2030 is from Excelencia in Education, a longstanding um, nonprofit organization that really the field has looked to and trusted um, really good housekeeping for us in terms of good housekeeping 
housekeeping seal for us um, in terms of, um, of information on Latino compute completion, even to the state level, um, you know, to support what Paula has said. So, okay, so we talked about pathways and then we talked about the states. And I think this is a great opportunity to say, how does this impact the learner? Um, and who is the learner? And so with that, I think what we'd love to do is, Eduardo um, would love to hear from you about the Smithsonian's Latino, uh, about the Smithsonian Latino Center's Museum Studies Program. And then we'll, we'll hear from Gabby after that. Thank you. Sure, thank you so much, uh, Domi. Yeah, um, first of all, you know, the Smithsonian is a, is, is an excellent place. It's a wonderful institution for students to immerse themselves in, in this particular case in museum practice. If in fact their area of study is something that ends up uh, in that direction or going in that direction, I should say. We started the Latino Museum Studies program back in 1994 and it's a program for graduate students, uh, those seeking master's degrees and PhDs. And you know it's, it's it's a great program. We have many graduates around the country doing great work in museums and in the academy, as well as here at the Smithsonian. But I recognize that I that I thought it would be important to, let's say, in, improve the return on investment. We know that the majority of Latinos and Latinas who are enrolled in post secondary education are enrolled in community colleges, not in four year institutions, and so. I felt that maybe if we got an earlier start with students before they made decisions on their academic trajectory that we could steer them into this area of, of museum of museum studies and museum practices. So I uh, decided that I would reach out to the uh, East, to East LA College, which is a very large community college uh, located as the name suggests in East LA, uh, which has the Vincent Price Art Museum on its campus. And I met with the visionary director then, uh, Pilar Tompkins Rivas, and I said, what if we were to identify some of the students at the college who also were docents or had other volunteer responsibilities at the museum who were interested, obviously, because they're at the museum volunteering and being docents and whatnot, if they would uh, be interested in coming to the Smithsonian and immerse themselves in, a, in an internship program that is tied to a course of study at the college and in this particular case, a museum studies seminar program. So we got three students in 2018 uh, to come in January. And I repeat, January in DC is not exactly uh, LA weather, right? So it was a great uh, shock to some of them when they got off the plane. I'm sure they probably were wondering what the heck they had signed up for. But at any rate, um, it was, it's been a wonderful um, experience um, and, uh, you know, we've been tracking um, the cohorts also that have come afterwards in 2019 and 2020. So what has started out as a pilot program has now become something core to the operations at, at the Latino Center. And I think it's really res our responsibility to bring on emerging um, Latin and Latino scholars and museum professionals, because the issue of representation, and we'll talk about this later, I guess, is really very important. We need to have first voice in the museum world. That is to say, people who are driving research, organizing exhibitions, building collections, informing public and educational programs, as well as the content that is that is online about our community, about that experience of what we have brought in building this country and shaping this national culture. We need to tell our own stories from that first voice uh, vantage point. We began also a Latino curatorial initiative in 2010, and we now have 12 um, curators and archivists working around the institution as well as nine curatorial assistants. And that's fine, but but this program is really more about non-curatorial uh, uh, areas as well, like conservators and exhibition designers and, and museum, um, I'm sorry, co collection managers and whatnot. And so that's the area that we're really focused on. So I'll stop there for now. I really wanted to introduce a, a video that features one of the students uh, from our original cohort in 2018, her name is Gabriela, or Gabi, by the uh, she is uh, from LA, from Los Angeles. Uh, she, uh, after graduating from uh, East LA College and after her participation at the Smithsonian, uh, she went on to study, get a, is about to get a degree in, in art history at UC Berkeley. Um, and I am proud to say that, I, I think I'm right in saying this, 
when she was at the Smithsonian, when she was with us in December of 2018, she interned with a very talented educator by the name of Beth Evans at the National Portrait Gallery. And now in speaking with Gabby in, a, in advance of this program, I learned that she's interested in going to graduate school and is thinking about museum ed, museum education. So I wonder if her experience at the Smithsonian may have had an impact on that, I guess so. But anyway, she's leaving herself open to also looking at museum studies and arts administration, a kind of work that I do. So I'm really happy uh, that she is, has moved on to better things and is gonna continue on her pathway. So let me introduce now the video with Gabriela Padilla. Hi everyone, my name is Gabriela Padilla. I'm a senior studying art history at the University of California, Berkeley, and I will be graduating this fall as the class of 2020. In early January 2018, I took part in the inaugural Smithsonian Undergraduate Internship Program organized by the Vincent Price Art Museum in collaboration with East Los Angeles College and the Smithsonian Latina Center. I was placed in the Museum Education Department at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery, and as a member of the Youth and Family Programs team, I worked with multi-generational audiences at the museum and participated in various NPG educational programs. I learned how to incorporate the arts in education and learned how arts education served as a new model for learning in the 21st century. By working closely with different communities, this internship program showed me the value of research centers and how crucial they are to gaining a greater understanding of the culture, tradition, and history of diverse communities. I consider myself very fortunate in taking part in the Smithsonian undergraduate internship and thankful for the many doors it has since opened for me. My academic journey from East Los Angeles College to UC Berkeley faced a lot of obstacles. Like many first-generation students, I faced a lack of college readiness, financial challenges, and a lack of professional mentoring, which put me at a disadvantage. It wasn't until my involvement with the Vincent Price Art Museum that I finally found my community, guidance, and the resources I needed to succeed. After my involvement with the Vincent Price Art Museum and the Smithsonian, I felt eager and confident enough to apply to universities, as well as to start out new experiences in different museum contexts. I have since entered at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the J. Paul Getty Museum, and the De Young Museum. And while my time at UC Berkeley, I have been assisting staff at the Latinx Research Center with research and upcoming projects. Over the years, my interest in museum education and museum studies has grown exponentially. I am confident the skills I have learned through my academic and work-related experiences will make me a valuable candidate for museum studies and arts administration graduate programs. As I enter this new chapter in my life, I very much look forward to my journey as an educator and hope to continue sharing my passion for the arts with diverse communities from around the world. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, I so wish we could all be in a room together right now so we could give Gabby a big uh, round of applause for sharing her story with us. Um, but I have to say, as I first uh, watched her video, Gabby's story definitely resonated with me, as I also was a transfer student who transferred from Glendale Community College down the way from Gabby uh, to UC Berkeley. So I'm going to sneak in a Go Bears there. Um, so Gabby's journey is really, really familiar to me. Um, I also had the benefit of participating in programs, including internships, that opened my eyes to possibilities that I really couldn't have imagined and to career paths that I couldn't have envisioned were it not for those opportunities. Um, growing up in an immigrant family and a low-income family, I wasn't really exposed to a wide breadth of career options. And as a first generation college student, navigating higher education was not easy as Gabby experienced. And that's what really drives our work at Lumina Foundation. We wanna ensure that we are redesigning systems that really weren't built for today's students to ensure that those students are able to succeed. Um, so I'll just end by saying that I'm super proud of Gabby for all of her accomplishments and for really taking advantage of opportunities um, that have come her way and that are going to open a lot of doors for her in the future. Absolutely.
and I just want to thank Gabby, um, you know, virtually and, and Paolo for sharing your stories. Um, and as you can hear, um, that navigating higher education can be daunting and taxing for Latinos. Um, but again, when you you can hear when the system begins to implement culturally sustaining practices, we see Latino students are able to succeed. Um, those holistic supports, I'll just call out some of the things, you know, I, we talked about those being important, but both mentioned by Gabby and Paolo were access to um, mentors, coaches, internships that were really um, helpful. We also know that access to programs that enable students to continue to care for their children and families is really important as well as food sustainability and transportation. Those financial supports like uh, student uh, state financial aid, federal financial aid, and then lastly, just a clear educational pathway that started where the students were. Um, Paula and Gabby both started at a community college with a very clear understanding of what courses to take, when, and then those courses were linked right into employment and further education. Again, so there's no guessing game about what's what's behind the curtain, what am I supposed to do, be doing? And so I think that just highlights for me, again, we must call on institutional and our state leaders to prioritize Latino students to implement these practices and ensure students get what they need by design and not by hope. So again, just thank you to Gabby and, and again, just congratulating her on her success. And of course, honored to work with Paula every day. Super, oh my goodness. Listen, my heart is being hard because Gabby um, is every student that we want to serve. Lumina does not have the answers to everything, obviously, but what we want to ensure that you take away from this webinar, this virtual event, is that learning matters and the learner matters. I mean, that without question is critical. Um, Paula's story, um, really her own personal journey, uh, including an equity journey that she's done herself. Um, we're gonna go ahead and share that on the website afterwards around her own personal equity narrative is really not a unique story, nor it is Gabby's. And really what Amber focused on, really this idea of what does student success look like and what are the component parts of student success are critical for Latino student success. And in all student success without question, but Latino student success, you saw the number 27%. We know that um, really learning after high school impacts uh, people of color more than others. Um, and so our discussion, this is really gonna be like a segue. This is the next part. And really, I think the most thought provoking part of our discussion um, that we hope will be encouraging, thought provoking, will have you thinking anew, um, how do we really shake ourselves out of this horrible upheaval and find uplifting and encouraging um, discussions. I'm gonna turn it over to Eduardo and to Jasmine. Um, really, we know the racial reckoning that has happened um, since the murder of George Floyd has been happening forever, okay? <laughs> since there's been the United States there has been some level of racial reckoning that has happened. Lumina has actually um, been very supportive. And again, we don't have the answers for everything, but we try and find solutions when we see uh, really systemic problems. Um, our board um, support, through the efforts of our leadership team and our board originally supported work after Charlottesville, um, really uh, we did a racial justice and equity grant around that. We are doing it again after the murder of, of Mr. Floyd. Um, and so there's focus there without question around race. Um, but we also know um, and are learning more and more um, through Jasmine's experts for us internally at Lumina, that there is diversity even within the Latino community and the same levels of racial reckoning and microaggression that you may hear about that people generally tend to say, oh, it's happening to only one diverse group is it's happening within each of these diverse groups. So it's not a monolith as Jasmine has shared. So I wanna turn that over to Eduardo and Jasmine, maybe to Jasmine first to get us started. Thank you. Thank you, Domi. Um, yeah, so now we wanna uh, just shift the conversation to talk about Latinos as a group within the US. So. As Domi mentioned, Latinos are not a monolith. They are, in fact, a very diverse group. And, um, you know, when we think about Latinos within the U.S., um, they are about 60 million uh, uh, people within the U.S. 
um, which makes up about 18% of the total population, and they are growing um, rapidly. Uh, within that umbrella of Latinos, there's um, great diversity, uh, not just by ethnicity. So when we think about um, Mexicans and Puerto Ricans are the largest Latino subgroups within the U.S., um, but there's also diversity in terms of phenotype and skin color. Um, and along with that, Afro-Latinos, uh, about a quarter of Latinos within the U.S. identify as Afro-Latino. Um, and there's been some uh, recent attention in the news um, around uh, Afro-Latino as an identity and, uh, and around anti-Black racism within the Latino community. Um, and I know something that uh, has come up in my prior research um, is that Black and Latino are not mutu mutually exclusive identities um, and that Latino is an ethnicity um, and, and not a race. And it's important to think about how um, there's diversity within the group. Uh, so with that being said, Eduardo, can you talk a little about the ways in which the Smithsonian, um, both short and long term, uh, plan to you know acknowledge the rich history um, of Afro Latinos uh, and also um, how uh, how you all will um, acknowledge the issue of anti Black racism within the Latino community. Sure. Thank you very much, Jasmine, for that uh, introduction to this uh, topic, which is, as you said, particularly important in these days. Um, you know, I think we need to begin with with knowledge, right? You know, the research. There has been so much erasure, so much exclusion about the experience of Afro-Latinos and Afro-Latinos since the beginning, since the colonial period, if you want to go that far back, um, and we should, in, in our analysis of, of of what's happening now and, and why things are the way they are. So I think it really begins with the scholarship, with, with the research, knowing the history. You know, I'm happy to say that there's a, a curator of Latinx studies at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, Ariana Curtis, who many probably know. Um, she's been an amazing voice and she is exactly in the place where she needs to be at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, in charge of accentuating, collecting, exhibiting, and so forth uh, around the, the Afro-Latino experience, because Afro-Latinos are also African-Americans, if you will. And so that's, that's one thing. So I think the knowledge base is important. What we put up on the walls is also important. And so to what extent are we incorporating the Afro-Latino experience in the work that is done from a historical, from an arts perspective, in portraiture at the National Portrait Gallery, for example, what are we doing to reflect uh, this experience? As you mentioned, 25 percent of our population identifies as African descended. Where are they? They're not there enough, in my view, and that needs to be corrected. If we claim to be the nation's museum, if we claim uh, to be about the totality of the Latino experience, then that has to include the experience of Afro-Latinos in a much more uh, serious manner. So, you know, we've we've been collect, we've been building collections in our own work at the Latino Center and, and building the, uh, the Molina Family Latino Gallery in its first exhibition. You will see the representation of events, figures, histories of, Afri of Afro-Latinos and Afro-Latinos in there. And that's fine, but we need to do much more. I, you know, we're looking uh, to utilize a very important online platform called the Learning Lab. And I invite um, viewers to visit learninglab.si.edu, learninglab, one word, .si.edu. It's a pretty robust digital platform where users can access a broad range of uh, Latino, uh, you, uh, Smithsonian resources, and they organize thematically. They're, one of the things that the Latino Center has just launched is a, a, a project called Art for Social Change, Conversations on Protest and Police Brutality. So we started out dealing with the Chicano Moratorium of 1970, uh, went on to the Mount Pleasant riots here in Washington, D.C. in 1971, and finished with the third um, 
aspect of this program, our third section of the program, uh, looking at Black Lives Matter beginning from 2013 to, to the present. And let me give a shout out to uh, Emily Key, Adriana Aldaba, and uh, Natalia Febo from our education team at the Latino Center who have done a fantastic job of bringing up these key issues, highlighting these key figures, going into what happened in the events. Now, the next talk, the next piece of this has to be a focus on Blackness and Latinidad. And that will be one of our upcoming projects within the Learning Lab. So stay tuned for that. I can't tell you exactly when that will, will be developed or in post, but it's forthcoming. We just need to do a lot more. You know, I'm bothered by the fact, for example, that too many Afro-Latinos find more of a home among African-Americans, right? Um, and African-American identities. That's because they find this sort of sense of, of reassurance and the almost self-love. And what are we doing, right? What is happening within our community that creates um, almost a sense of, of, I don't know, almost animosity in some ways, right? And, and sort of amplifying even white privilege within our own communities. I mean, look at Univision and Telemundo and, and popular culture. Where are we, right? Yes, we have entertainers. Yes, we have sports figures that are important. Uh, among the Latino, Afro-Latino community, but we need to go much deeper and look at what un underscores the history and the consequences of that history in contemporary life within our communities. That's wonderful, Eduardo, my goodness. Um, and I wanted to see if we can bring back Jasmine uh, because I, I would love to hear Jasmine, your response to um, what you just heard from Eduardo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think I think it's wonderful um, the the online work you're doing with the the learning lab uh, and and the other initiatives within the museum. Um, you know, I I resonate with. Um, your anger about the anti-blackness within the Latino community. And, um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that Afro-Latinos are black, right? That is their uh, identity research shows that, that that is what they view as their primary race and identity. Um, and these, these notions of, within within group fighting uh, are are not helpful um, because what it does is distract from the larger problem um, at play, uh, which is uh, racism and white supremacy. And so what's important to keep in mind is that um, in order for us to, reach full liberation for us to dismantle inequities. Um, all minoritized and racialized groups need to join in solidarity uh, and anti-Black racism uh, does not help that effort. Um, and so that's something that we all need to keep in mind as we do our, our respective work moving forward. Yep, totally agree. Absolutely. No, and the Smithsonian has a role to play there, right? As do other institutions, whether they be media institutions or educational, you know, universities and whatnot. Um, yeah, I, you know, we've got to do more. We have, to, you know, we have Afro-Latino representation in other units of the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian American Art Museum with uh, Carmen Ramos, our curator of Latino art and so forth. But we need to do, you know, there needs to be a lot more work. And, and I don't think enough history and other enough research has been done on this you know we have to bring this forward and not stay there and i'm not suggesting that we you know go back and talk about you know you know mejorar la raza and pelo malo bad hair and all these ridiculous notions that we have in our communities yeah we need to look at that for sure we need to unmask that and, and say what it is but i but i do think we have a responsibility of going deeper in a more contemporary way and dealing with issues more upfront. i'm all for that this is amazing. Okay. <laughs> I, I feel like I need four hours to cover everything we've covered already today. Um, you know, we know that we're getting questions around our upcoming convenings. Um, what do we mean by spark to a shift? Um, 
Uh, and we want to just use this um, webinar as an example to just bring us all together um, as we close down. Uh, on, I know we have a remaining nine minutes on this call. Um, so one of the things we wanted to share with you is that this is a beginning conversation, not only with the Smithsonian, but how Lumina moves forward with our virtual convenings. Um, again, we used to have convenings that were like people we knew, um, emerging people, but what we're really seeing as a silver lining to virtual is that anyone can attend. And so we're really looking for your best thinking, anything you'd like to share with us, certainly with the Smithsonian and the Smithsonian Latino Center. Um, we're here as a resource. Again, as Eduardo said, it is .edu for a reason. I love that. I've been using that so much. Um, the other part of this is really, um, we're looking at this as, we hope what you've taken away from this is that this wasn't information sharing only. Um, this was also about this idea of, of how we can be a resource to you. And so with that, I want to go uh, first to Paola and then to Eduardo to share final thoughts. Um, uh, uh, Paola, what are your final thoughts from Lumina as we talk here? Sure, Is sure. Here? Thank you, Domi. Uh, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about throughout is that when we look at school-aged children in the U.S., one in four school-aged children in the U.S. is now Latino. And so I think this conversation just really hits home for me that we all have a stake in helping Latino students succeed. And as the Smithsonian's work has shown us, um, all types of organizations can play a role in creating pathways for our Latino students, uh, not only for them to succeed academically, but for them to enter into fulfilling careers that they're really passionate about. And, you know, as we heard from uh, Eduardo and Jasmine, uh, the other takeaway that I have is that we also all can play a role in helping to address the erasure, the racism, and the colorism that our Afro-Latinos communities are facing. Um, so Domi, you said that you love that the Smithsonian uh, is .edu, not .org. One of the things I love is that the Smithsonian describes itself as a community of learning and the opener of doors. Because I think um, as we've seen today and as Gabby's story has exemplified, they're doing just that for the next generation of our uh, Latino students and Latino arts professionals. So I'm really looking forward to continuing the conversation and to exploring ways that we can continue to work together to really benefit our Latino community. And Eduardo, what are your thoughts? We we know that we're going to be seeing a video soon from uh, the Molino Gallery, but really wanted your final thoughts. Um, sure. You really know, quickly. that'd be great. Yeah, really, really quickly. The Smithsonian is a storyteller. So the question then becomes, who's telling the story, right? And up to now, it hasn't been as an inclusive and as diverse. The body of storytellers has not been as inclusive and diverse as it really needed to be. So that's what these pathway programs that we're working on are all about. To the extent that we bring in Gabby Padilla to work as a full-time educator at, at the National Portrait Gallery, we will have achieved something because it's about representation in the first voice that we need to drive these stories. This is amazing. I mean, again, I, I want an extra hour or two for each of the subject matters we just touched on today. Um, really, um, this is to us at Lumina the beginning of how we have emerging conversations with current and new audiences that are sparked to a shift. How are we going to take this information, create ways of saying, from this point forward, I will do this new thing. Um, and we really are looking forward to doing that. What we do know is that um, the Smithsonian Latino Center, uh, you know, Eduardo, the amazing work you all are doing, um, we're just delighted by it. We know that the Molina Gallery um, is a very important part, body of work um, with that. So we're gonna go to this video, but before we do, I just wanna thank each and every one of you, each of our panelists, Eduardo Diaz from the Smithsonian Latino Center, my colleagues, Amber Garrison Duncan, <laughs> um, Paula Santana, and Jasmine Hayward with the Lumina Foundation, with Lumina Foundation. And really there are 70 of us, about 70 of us, if you can count interns, 
um, that have really been just a wonderful source of information for us. But for this particular one, we just want to say thank you and hope that will allow this will allow you all to continue the conversation as we're done. So with that, we're going to close out. Listen, people, you can fill social media. Just go ahead and do that. You can reach out to us directly. We're just delighted that you joined us and feel free to share the link with others once you have access to our website. So with that, we're going to close with this wonderful, uplifting for me personally. Um, I just find whatever comes to museums are like self-care. And what the Molina Gallery video here exemplifies what the Smithsonian Latino Center is doing. So thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. My parents taught us to work hard and always put others before ourselves. You know, my father grew up in Yuma during the Depression, and so he had an affinity, I think, for people that were struggling. My parents and, and my dad, they never set out to reach millions of people. They sought out to improve lives, one at a time. When you help, it wasn't to get other people's attention, it wasn't to get glory or someone to notice you. It was to help because that's the right thing to do. Dad was a general practitioner who then went into emergency medicine and noticed that there were a lot of people who came to the emergency room who really didn't have emergencies but didn't have a primary care doctor to see. So he opened a clinic and that ended up growing to a dozen clinics and more and then eventually became Molina Healthcare. He was always there. He was always available. His commitment was to the patients and making sure that everybody had accessible health care. Helping people who were often underserved or overlooked was important. And after he passed away, uh, we kept that going. We want to instill a sense of pride, a sense of this is who we are, this is where we've been, and this is where we're going. In Latino culture, your heritage and your ancestors are very important and we pass down our values from generation to generation. That's what legacy is. It's keeping that in mind, keeping those values and passing them down. His story is one that inspired the people that he knew and the people that knew of him. And the Smithsonian, well, my husband likes to say, the Smithsonian is where history is made. Part of this is to make sure that he is not forgotten and that people understand what he did and I want him to be remembered, I want his family to be remembered, and I want people to know about the contributions they made. I think it's exciting, and I think people will be interested to come and see what the Latino culture is about and how Latinos have added to the fabric of America. I'd also like them to see that Smithsonian thinks it's important enough to show Latinos on a national stage. The gallery is something that we hope will inspire many others, that people that can see themselves in the Smithsonian will go on to do great things. <laughs>